Welcome back to or welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, my name is Cheyenne Alton. And if you have, thank you so much for watching my videos and supporting me. It really does mean a lot to me. And this is episode 3 in my new series, True Crimes of Australia. And yeah, still covering the Ivan Malat case. There is at least another two to story video coming and it's just easier if I split it up and go into detail about each of the things that happen. Um, just a disclaimer, like I said in the other two videos, this, these episodes especially will be centred heavily on rape, murder, gun, violence, dysfunctional home and family life, robbery and mental health conditions. If you feel you are easily affected by stuff like this, I will recommend clicking off the video now before I get into the case. So like I just mentioned, this is episode 3 on in this series and on the Ivan Malat, the Bathacker murders case. And this episode will be about the discovery of Caroline Clark, Joanne Walters, James Gibson and Deborah Everest. So like I've already mentioned in the video on what this series will look like and as you can probably already tell from my last two episodes um, I am doing this in as much of a cohesive timeline as possible so I will be going off when the victims were found not when they first went missing and it would not be until the 19th of September 1992 that the first two bodies were found in the Belangelo State Forest using dental records they were able to confirm that the bodies were of two female British backpackers, 21-year-old Caroline Jane Clark and 22-year-old Joanne Leslie Walters. The pair were actually really good friends and they had a flat together, I'm pretty sure, in Sydney. And Caroline Clark was from Surrey, South East England and Joanne Walters was from Maesteg, Wales. I think that's how you say it. Maesteg, Maesteg, I don't know. The two girls were actually the last of the backpackers, known backpackers victims, to have gone missing, but they were the first to have their bodies slash remains found. And they were last seen in April of that year, and they were on their way to go fruit picking in Victoria, which is as you can tell what a lot of backpackers did to earn money while travelling. They would go fruit picking and do small jobs around the country. The first body was found by two runners, Keith Seely and Keith Caldwell, who were orienteering through the Belangelo State Forest. They saw something while running and stopped, and they were really shocked to find that it was a decomposing body, and the body was actually of Joanne Walters. And when they found the body, the body was face down on the dirt with their hands tied behind their back. The following morning, while police were out um, investigating the crime scene, they sadly found a, another body. And it was found just 98 feet, which is 29.8 metres away from where John Walter's body was discovered. And their body was... Their bodies were discovered in a place in the Belangelo State Forest called Executioner's Drop. They performed autopsies on the bodies and the autopsy sadly confirmed that the two young adults were brutally slaughtered. Um, Clark had been blindfolded and marched into the area where she was murdered, execution style, and she was shot ten times in the head. It led police to believe that the killer had used Clark as target practice from about 10 metres away. 10 22 calibre Winchester cartridges were discovered 3.5 metres away from Clark's head and they found three of the bullets in the ground under Clark's head and seven were later re recovered from her head during her autopsy. Upon further investigation, they found six cigarette butts at the scene. Five of them were confirmed to be Long Beach cigarettes, the brand that Clark smoked. The sixth, however, was unidentifiable, and the weird thing about this was Ivan Malat didn't smoke, never smoked, hated it, and he never did it. The Long Beach cigarettes were believed to have been smoked 
by Clark and it actually suggested to police that the killer slash killers had been there for at least half an hour before killing her. However, sadly, Joanne Walters was stabbed multiple times, not just once or twice, 14 times. Some sources claim that she was stabbed 21 times in the back and 14 times in the chest, but most sources claim that she was only stabbed 14 times. Joanne Walters had been stabbed four times in the chest, once in the neck, and nine times in the back. And the force behind the stabs and the amount that she had in the back were enough to ultimately sever her spine and cut through her ribs and her cervical vertebrae. Sadly, to investigators, it appeared that both of the girls had been sexually attacked, but because their bodies were really decomposed, it's really hard to tell. And what was really shocking and made the case harder to solve was because the bodies were found in two completely different conditions and they were murdered in two completely different ways. It actually led police to believe that they were dealing more so with two killers rather than just one or a serial killer. The reason why investigators really believed that they were dealing with two killers was because um, the use of a gun suggested that one of the killers preferred killing at a distance and more impersonal approach, whereas the use of a knife suggested to the police that this other killer really preferred using a more personal approach to killing. And a lot of murders that involve knives and stabbing are said to be passion or passionate murders because of the emotion and rage behind attacking someone with a knife and stabbing them to death. And it would make sense that it was passionate rage murder because the force behind the stab wound, you would have to be pretty pissed off or real strong to do that. And it's common knowledge that when you're angry, you're much stronger than you normally are. Dr. Peter Flattis, a forensic pathologist, and Dr. Christopher Griffin, a forensic odontologist, which is a dental expert, were called in to inspect the scene, and they inspected bodies in the forest before the bodies were moved to the morgue at Glebe. After making this horrific discovery, Police and investigators decided to comb the area around the forest a bit more, hoping to either find more evidence to lead to or suggest to police who the killer slash killers might be. But they were ultimately also looking for more bodies for the other backpackers that had gone missing around the area in the past couple of years from when Joanne, Walters and Caroline Clark were found. Um, at the time they didn't find anything, but sadly the theory that there were more bodies in the Belangelo State Forest would be proven correct the following year when more bodies were uncovered. On the 5th of October 1993, another body was discovered, well two bodies. Um, at first it was just one when a bushman was searching for firewood in a remote part of the Blanchelo State Forest and he came across a fully intact skeleton and he reported it to police and when the police came back to the scene with the man they sadly found another body at the scene as well. The bodies were later um, identified as a young teenage couple from Melbourne, Deborah Phyllis Everest and James Harold Gibson. They had actually gone missing in 1989 and their bodies were found nearly four years later. The pair, the young couple, were sadly both only 19 when they were brutally slaughtered and they were the first out of all these known victims to go missing and they went missing on December 30th 1989. They were actually the first to go missing as I mentioned and their 
bodies weren't found until almost four years later. And their disappearance happened three weeks, roughly three weeks, before Paul Onion's interaction with Ivan Millard. The location of the couple's bodies really confused police as their belongings had been found um, 75 miles or 120.7 um, kilometers north in December of 1989. The couple's bodies were found 500 meters away from a walking reserve called Executioner's Drop, which was where the bodies of Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters were found. The intact skeleton that the bushman had found was James Gibson, and sadly he was found in fetal position with his shoes still on, and what was left of his black fluffy hat that he used to always wear was found near him. James Gibson was found with eight stab wounds on his body, and the stabs had been so deep that his lungs and heart had been punctured, and the amount of force that the person using the knife used, it didn't break his bones when he was being stabbed, it cut clean through his spine and his ribs. Upon looking at the body more, they found that Gibson's clothes actually showed signs that there may have been sexual assault involved with this case. The reason why police strongly believe that and still do is because when they found him, his pants fly was undone but his top button was done up. This indicated to police and investigators that the killer was trying to get them done back up really quickly and he missed the fly. But sadly at this point James and Deborah's bodies had been there for nearly four years and James' bodies were far too decomposed for them to actually tell if sexual assault had occurred during the times of the couple's murders. James Gibson lived with his family in Maroochic, a Melbourne suburb in the Mornington Peninsula. However, with Deborah Everett, she was found to have one stab wound in the back, but when they looked closer at her remains, they found that she had been severely beaten, her jaw was fractured or broken, her head was really messed up and fractured and her remains had been scattered around the area. The couple were from Melbourne and Deborah lived with her family in Frankston and she was a really cool person by the sounds of it. She did quite a lot of great things. She was a Greens activist. She had taken part in a lot of anti-logging protests all over the east coast and her and James actually met at a concert in mid-1989. When they were backpacking, they had, were staying in Sydney with friends of James who did um, live in Surrey Hills at the time. And when they were left, they were headed to Walwa, which is on the Victorian side of the um, Murray River. And they had planned to go to an alternative bush festival known as Confest. And they had arranged to meet with some of their friends while they were there, but they never showed up and they were never heard from again. After the families and friends of the couple hadn't heard from them in a while and with them not showing up at the festival, they got really worried and the mother of Deborah and the mother of James immediately, as soon as they grew concerned, went to the Frankton Police Station and filed missing persons reports for both of them. And again, police were not immediately concerned by this. They just thought maybe they're late, they're doing whatever, they've run away. Um, they were not thinking at this time because that there was a serial killer. There was no bodies found, there were no victims, there was no alarming rates of people going missing or one group of people being targeted. And they didn't realise that there was a serial killer working away at Backpackers. Anyways, that is all for today's video. I hope you guys like it. I know it was very heavy, very depressing. I'm gonna go hug, hug my dog to feel better. But it is part of the case and I believe their story deserves to keep getting told because it's just a warning to all of us. 
we need to be careful we need to question everything and everyone around us to stay safe and yeah so my heart do go out to the families of the victims I know it was so long ago but the pain never truly fades anyways that is all and again Sins of the Brother Catching the Malat book which was info for Catching Malat highly suggest you get these books I will have all my sources linked down below and the links for these books. They're really good, they're interesting reads, they're pretty long. So they'll keep you interesting on a they'll keep you interested and entertained on a rainy day. Anyways, I love you guys and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!